So basically, I want to give, first and foremost, I want to thank Julia for the invitation to be part of the Summer of Scholarship series. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk about this weird and wacky and wonderful and kind of strange and disturbing, but often beautiful play. Uh, some of these ideas, uh, Julia was kind to say that I've thought about this and, and written about it a lot, but I also, um, I also am still workshopping in my own head a lot of the things that I'm going to be discussing today. And part of that is not just because I myself am much like this play, sort of restless and an idea morphs into another idea. And I find myself in all of these different um, locales suddenly in my own brain. But I also think that this play is a play that is sort of um, not to be too punny about it, but it's slippery. It's hard to it's hard to get a handle on. It's never fully coming to rest, which is both some of the challenge of dealing with this play and some of the excitement, I think. So um, for anybody out there in the audience who knows the play or is more familiar with, um, in particular with Shakespeare's later works, this bears a lot of resemblance to some of the moves you will see in The Tempest, Winter's Tale, and Cymbeline, or, or you've seen any of the um, productions at the New Swan this summer, please, I really encourage you to think about comments and questions for, for the chat. I prefer a conversation to a lecture, and I'm delighted to have everyone here in this room to build toward that conversation. So with that in mind, I'm going to share my ideas, and I'm going to share some of my readings of this, of this play and the ways that I see it working in performance and adaptive response in the 21st century, but I'm also very interested in your ideas and your responses. Just to start with some of the terms that I'm going to be messing around with, I'm very interested in the way that migration and displacement and sort of and and, and sort of the these shipwrecks function as a vehicle to put people in spaces of precarity and spaces of harm, and then how those spaces of harm and movements of of, of danger work toward a larger recovery in the play. This is a play that begins telling us that it's been um, read as a restorative, that idea of restoration, of redemption, of recovery, of reconciliation, of reunion, all of these RE words. We're all always coming back to something that has been lost. Um, I think often when we think about this play and some of the other late plays, we think about the providential. We think about how that, how that recovery comes through a literal deus ex machina, right? Or comes through these miraculous passing of time or these incredible coincidences. I would like to, in this talk and in the way that I'm thinking about this play, shift a little bit and think about work and labor and, and action, the acts of hope. So hope not merely as an attitude, but as a framework for interpreting action. I think it's in that that this play really speaks to us as contemporary audiences, I think that often when we go see these late plays, we are less interested in, in, in what the gods have to say and more interested in how human labor is, a, is necessary to bring us to this sense of possibility that all of these plays turn on. All of these late plays, they bring us to a sense of the future, a sense of a hope for the future that I think is not a hallmarky kind of, you know, paper thin, Hope, but a hope that's really rooted in, in, in time and work. And I think there actually is, in addition to a spiritual valence to that, a real political valence to that. So with that in mind, I'm going to get into the meat of some of the things that I would like to focus on. What does Sarah Mon say? Bring meat for the, it's a cold night out there. Bring meat for, 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 for everybody to, you know, again, recovery and restoration. But I'm going to get into some of the specific scenes that I want to focus on, um, and I'll give you a little map of where we're going to go in the next half an hour or so. Much like this play itself is very much a traveling play, right? Helicanus tells Pericles, oh, go travel for a while. That's his advice, and that's an advice to escape danger, but of course the sea itself then becomes an agent of danger. So there is no real escape from danger in this play. What happens, what happens in terms of protection, in terms of uh, of strategies of, of of care and survival, that has to be internal. That has to be that has to that is not going to come from external province. That's internal. So 
First, I'm going to think about the ways in which the play itself deals with migration and displacement. Why is this play so mappy the, besides the fact that it's coming from this, you know, um, source that's in the tradition and um, Hellenic antiquity and then through Gower's Confessio Amantes, besides that as the source text, what is the interest in these spaces, right? We're in this Eastern Mediterranean zone. Um, this is, for those of you who are unfamiliar for, with these names of antiquity, this is now mostly what would be Lebanon and Turkey and Greece um, and Northern Africa. Why is this place moving around so much? What does this play have to offer us in terms of thinking through mobility? And in particular, oceanic mobility and oceanic mobility as a way of structuring both dramaturgically and also thematically notions of harm, of separation, and the, 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 the losses from which the arc of the play demands we reach some sort of recovery. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to focus briefly on a few examples of why I think this play has become interesting to theater makers and artists in the 21st century. There's sort of an explosion of interest in this play. And, I, and it's a play that was very popular in its own time. There's um, some suggestion that, it, that, it, was, that you know, it had a good run in the early 1600s. Ben Johnson makes reference to it um, disparagingly. As, uh, um, and, and, but but it, was not, it was not very popular for, for, for m many of the past few centuries. Um, in the 20th century, it's not was it performed all that often? Um, it, it's the it's the title of a, of a very, very beautiful poem by T. S. Eliot, Marina. So he's drawing on that reference. But but this is no one is as familiar with this play outside of our little field of Shakespeare studies as they would be with the Tempest or perhaps even the Winter's Tale. Um, Cymbeline is another bag entirely. But we'll do that we'll do that in a different talk because that is a wacky play. I'm gonna then turn to thinking about the ways in which both scholars and artists are working with this play in terms of these broader trends in Shakespeare studies, both at the university and in performance and in other cultural products such as, such as civic engagement projects, novels, other ways of using Shakespearean drama to think about contemporary issues of social justice, contemporary issues around border justice and migration, contemporary issues around racial justice and Black Lives Matter, contemporary issues of using Shakespearean precedent, both as text and as cultural canon, to, to provide a framework for thinking through urgent questions of the political present. So this is very much a play that, that is stretching way back in time, but I like to also think that it's stretching into our present and into our future and into a time when we too are sort of looking for these actions of hope, strategies of hope at a time that um, may look bleak, at least the past five years or so, I think to many of us, that has been the case. As I said, before, then I'm going to move to the part that I am most looking forward to, which is getting to respond to your ideas, continue to flesh out some of my thoughts on this uh, play a little bit, and hear your take on all of the things that we're discussing from the contemporary political and social resonances of the play to the new Swan production, which is beautiful. If you haven't had the chance to see it, I highly recommend you go see it, to the ways in which this fits into broader movements in theater, in Shakespeare, and in our social life. You'll see in this picture here um, from the UCI New Swan production, Randall Thompson's Pericles, I was unable to get a picture of the scene what I wanted, which is when he's actually washing up on shore. But but he looks he looks he looks like he's struggling a bit in this, even though he does have the nice coat draped over him. So you get a sense of what's happening to Pericles. And what's happening to Pericles throughout this play is shipwreck after shipwreck loss after loss, almost an absurd uh, uh, um, amount of bad luck. Um, and so I think what's interesting here is thinking about the way in which the play first throws Pericles onto the shore of Pentapolis. And he is this, he is this prince, he is this king to be, he's escaped, um, he's escaped from Ant Antiochus because his life is in danger and he ends up thrown up on the shore without his clothes, without his armor. And he 
he is in a position of extreme vulnerability, extreme precarity. He is a figure of need, right? He presents himself into, um, he presents himself before this group of fishermen, these incredibly funny group of collective seaside workers doing their work. They speak in a very sort of punny English of the time, um, very much sounds like Jacobean English. They don't sound like they're anywhere in the Hellenic antiquity. Um, and 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 they're, they're, they, they come across as a sort of community, a sort of tight knit community, so much as they're fishermen one and fishermen two, and they're picking up on each other's jokes. And I think that this scene is interesting for all kinds of reasons, but one of which is it really first introduces us to a form of collective labor, a form as labor as sustenance, a form as labor as healing and a vehicle for taking care of each other. I saw a beautiful production of this play at UCLA not too long ago, directed by Michael Hackett. And I talked to Michael and he said, oh, the Marxist fishermen. I love those Marxist fishermen. And, 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 and so I said, thank you, Michael. From henceforth, whenever I discuss this play, I will teach them as the Marxist fishermen. And I, I taught them to my students today as the Marxist fishermen. And I don't know what my students think about that, but that's, that's what it's going to be from here on. So first we get the fishermen, but then we get Pericles. Pericles, the king to be. Pericles, who washes up on shore. And this is how he describes himself. This quotation is how he frames himself, how he presents himself to the fishermen. So just to get in the room besides my own, would anybody be willing to read how Pericles presents? We have some volunteers here lined up for you. Wonderful. Um, Barbara Mello, do you want to read this? Yes. OK. Thank you. <laughs> A man whom both the waters and the wind in that vast tennis court hath made the ball for them to play upon, entreats you pity him. He asks of you that never used to beg. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate Sorry, that. Clumsy, but <laughs> so again, we have him speaking in verse rather than prose that distinguishes him from these fishermen, but he does not say, hey, I'm a king. He does not say, hey, he, I'm going to exert my sort of status position here in order to demand. He presents himself as a figure of need and relies entirely on their generosity of care. Another thing that I think is interesting here in terms of the shape of the play is in this first part of the play, when, she, when Pericles is first shipwrecked and then there's all these losses and potential losses to come, he structures himself by way of an attitude of kind of acceptance, right? He doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, this is what I'm going to do to resolve this problem. He asks for help, which is recognizing his own vulnerability, but he also positions himself, interestingly, because it's him doing the rhetorical positioning himself as somebody who, who is just an object. Right, just an object tossed from place to place by these powers, by these powers. There's, there's sort of a fatalistic kind of approach here um, that asks of need, but also suggests that the self is, is, is definitionally limited in agency or completely without agency. This is this thing that happens in this play where Pericles becomes sort of a figure of suffering where just one bad thing after another continues to happen to this person. And in whatever that initial sense of character that we get where he brings the corn in the earlier scene as another act of generosity, another act of care, he just sort of becomes an object to get continually um, put into positions of harm more and more to the point where he becomes completely inactive, stops shaving and cutting his hair and stops speaking. He shuts down. Pericles, becomes a figure where he allows himself to sort of shut down and just take whatever is thrown at him. So this is sort of the first way I think in which this play is asking us to think about a world that is precarious, a world that uses the sea to suggest the, the almost the inevitability of harm and loss and rupture and, and death and family disruption and then we're given we're given a sort of an ad, attitudinal approach, which is one that withstands and accepts and does not sort of fight back. Becomes sort of passivity as a strategy of dealing 
with the world in which we live, right? Which is not just the play world, but again, a world where any of us are subject to these same bodily vulnerabilities that this play wants to explore. This play talks about hunger. It talks, it talks about death. It talks about childbirth. It talks about medicine and, and, and healing. Shelter. It talks about clothing, right? This play is working on us and with us at the most basic level of human need. And so in that, it demands a sort of strategy of its characters, and it demands a sort of strategy of us as, as participants in the play world and also in participants who are always existing with, with, the, with this kind of bifurcated vision of being within the play world, but seeing the play world as simultaneously like and unlike the real world in which we live. As the play moves forward, um, and I, I expand on this a bit more when I'm writing about this, but I think that the, this is a core scene of when the play is sort of switching from a, its focus on harm and loss and beginning to hinge on with the birth of Marina, Pericles' daughter, with, with a turn toward thinking about the future rather than the past, with a turn toward thinking about action and resistance and activity and work rather than passive acceptance. And this is all happening in this moment of birth and death, or what we think is birth and death, as we, as we see Thaisa, Pericles' bride, giving birth to Marina, and then, and then very shortly thereafter, dying in childbirth, dying in labor. Again, I think there's, this play is interested in labor, both as the idea of childbirth as an emblem of the future, as an emblem of how to recover past harms through a, a, a hope for the future, and also labor as other forms of work, which also all work <laughs> that's worth itself, that's valuable, is building toward a better future, right? I think this, I think this play wants us to think about these things. I want to call attention um, to the, the wonderful uh, Mary Marie Hill as Diana on the right side, who sort of presides over this, this UCI New Swan um, play with Gower as these figures that sort of guide us, right? They guide us, but what I like is often that guidance is they're kind of on the sidelines, they're in the shadows. Sometimes it's clear that they're, 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 they're helping, but they're, they're, they're quiet moments of assistance that don't actually, I think, deny the real human labors that are happening um, throughout this play, the real human labor, labors that are leading us toward this sense of, of, okay, how are we going to heal these past wrongs? And how are we going to think about community? whether that community is a polis, right, Pericles as leader, as future king, um, um, or whether that community is a family, right? These different kinds of social structures that, that, that can get damaged and broken and need to be repaired. This is a play that begins with imagery of poison and venom and, and something that, that in some ways stains or makes ill. And we have to work all this way. We have to work our way through through four full acts and a number of weird choric uh, stitching together of of these episodic movements to get to where we the play wants us to get, which is to that point of healing. So this moment, I think, is a crucial um, turn in the play. Would somebody be willing to read this particular batch of text? Uh, Jessica Rosenau has volunteered. Yeah, I can read it. Oh, how, Lycordia, how does my queen, thou stormiest, stormiest venomously, wilt thou spit all thyself? The seaman's whistle is as a whisper in the ears of death. Unheard, Lycordia, Lucina, oh, divinest patroness and midwife gentle, to those that cry by night, convey the deity. Aboard our dancing boat, make swift the pangs, of my queen's travails now lycordia thank you thank you so much i love thou stormiest venomously both because stormiest is just so playful and cool but also because venomously brings us back to that to that threat always of contamination in this play that threat always of something that is 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 going to cause danger and then there's the invocation of lucina who's connected to diana 
goddess of, of childbirth, again, of the future, moving toward the future. And I think the other thing I want to call attention to here, just to not belabor the point, too much belabor, is travails, right? This idea here of, of Pericles referencing the childbirth, but of course, travail, travel, we're in this space where, where, where it is the precarity of labor. It is, the, it is all work as, as on this knife edge, on this razor's edge of either potentially causing us great harm or being a conduit toward this necessary and, and I think quite beautiful kind of future healing. As the play moves forward, it presents us with an, an incredibly fascinating and, and crucial character to this play. And I think that some of it may be because of this particular interest in travel. And this is Marina named so because she was born of sea. Marina who says, uh, when, when she's asked, are you of these shores? She says, nor of, not of these shores, nor of any shores. Right? Beautiful line, nor of any shores. Um, the scholar Braden Cormack calls her the most perfect stranger in a play that is obsessed with strangerhood, is obsessed with out of placidness, right? And what's interesting there is Marina's out of placeness, her inability to actually fully be settled, makes her emblematic of this play, but also depends on that perfection. There's a strange sort of nearly kind of angelic perfection that Marina gives us that is sort of difficult to grapple with, right? There are times when she see, she comes across very much as a figure of resistance and refusal, and I um, and I focus on those moments. But there are other times where her particular relationship to the play's themes is, is almost like she is she's she's getting us too far away from from that danger because of the power that she seems to just internally have to hold sway over people. Um, I think. What I really like about Marina, and just for those of you who, who don't know the play very well, I'll bring you up to speed on what's happening in this particular quotation. So Marina is, like her father before her, about to be murdered. She, she is in danger. She escapes, she buys herself some time because she's a, she's a good talker. So she, she's able to escape. She's kidnapped by pirates. She is sold, she is sex trafficked. She is sold into, into a brothel in Midland. In that brothel, um, she is able to not only talk potential would-be customers out of doing what they intend to do when they walk into that establishment, but reject their interest in doing such things, period, and then finally talk her way out of that establishment by proving that she has these different capacities. She, they're proving that she can be the, um, the head of a sort of school. And that school is presented as it says, a leafy shelter that abuts against the side of the aisle, right? This leafy shelter. So we have shelter, we have sanctuary, which again, gonna, gonna call forward, always with this play moving forward and backward to the next in the series of talks, thinking about sanctuary. In this moment in the play, we have, although Marina doesn't know it, Thaisa's, Thaisa, her mother, is, is, in, is in a temple to Diana, which is also serving as a sort of sanctuary. And then we have Marina, who comes to preside over a sanctuary, but is not just a sanctuary of, uh, of safety and of shelter, though that is important, but a place of labors, a place of work, right? And, I, and that work is in some ways coded as aristocratic potentially and, and feminine potentially, but it is also a place wh where the destructive forces of the commercial environment that we've seen of Midland is trans transposed, transformed into productive and creative forces of labor. Forces of labor that, that, that are artistic and that provide care. And again, we can think I think of Marina with the pupils in this schoolhouse, sort of like the fishermen at the seaside, doing their thing, working together, right? Working together in this space of collective labor and sanctuary. So um, would somebody be willing to read this particular passage um, about Marina? Um, how about Katie Schubert? 
Uh, sure. Uh, if you can't hear me, let me know. I'm in kind of a loud Yeah, we, place. Got, we got it. We got okay, it. gotcha. Uh, deep clerk, she dumbs, and with her nail composes nature's own shape of bud, bird, branch, or berry, that even her art sisters, the natural roses, her ankle silk twin with the rubied cherry, that pupils lack she none. Thank you, right? So I think in a play that does not generally rely on rhyme, except for in sort of some of the clunkier Gower passages, that the turning to rhyme here is, I think, the play itself showing us labor and composition and creative work as it's describing labor and creative work. I think the poetic techniques there of, of rhyme and, and the meter and, and using sisters there as a verb, right? like using sisters there as a verb calling us back to thinking about she there in this in this homosocial community of other women who she, who all learning together i i think that the play is flexing a little bit of its poetic muscle to show us how important this shelter is to show us how important marina's role in this position is so back to that back to my sense of of, of labor the very moments in the play moments years <laughs> acts where where Pericles has decided to never speak again, never shave again. We have Marina here, and what's she doing? She's making stuff, right? She's making stuff in the special place at the shoreline where she, where she is in some way related to, continually engaged with the unpredictable movements of the sea, but also finding a steady place on land, finding a steady place in the shoreline space that is in some way in between the rough commerce of the city and and the wild waters of the sea, right? And I think in this twin, these twin acts, these sister acts of the refusal in the brothel, the the willingness to take agency and control and reject the the situation that she's that she's been given, and also that she becomes an educator and a protector in some way suggests. To me that marina is the central figure of this play central because she never really is in the center this is a play that never allows us to have a center um i will say that it, i wouldn't be fully honest if i didn't admit that i that little dot 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 there that ellipses is because it goes on to to, to make reference to her pupils being noble um i omit that because i don't want to read it that way <laughs> and i don't think we have to Right, because the play is now ours, and, and and I think we do not have to stress some of these things because if we want to use this play in the 21st century, and I think that we do, and that's where I'm turning next. I think if we want to move this play in the 21st century, we want we want to find ways in which this particular noble family is not a figure of exceptionality only, and that that exceptionality, if it's there, is not connected in any way to class status or even uglier blood but is connected to all of us in some way and our potential for resilience, resistance, and creative acts that hinge on a hope for a better future. I think that is in part why this play is really interesting to 21st century artists. It's a play that, that is moving around so much. It says, born to born, region to region, as Gower tells us, right? There's that funny thing in act four where he's like, don't don't be don't be bothered that we use English even though we're in all these different places. It's okay as if we hadn't been doing that for four acts already. But that movement from region to region, I think, makes us think in the present about mobility in our present 21st century life, where we have greater forced migration than ever in history. So it's very interesting to me, and I think crucial in terms of the ways in which this play can be useful to us useful to us as scholars, useful to us as artists, useful to us as teachers, as, as thinkers, as writers, to think about why this play has been so interesting to scholars and artists who are considering mobility and considering in particular refugees in the 21st century. There's a landmark 2003 Adrian Jackson Cardboard Citizens production that ended up um, doing a, a tie-in with the RSC because it was very successful, where they intersperse sections from the play with testimonials from 21st century refugees. 
and they really stress this this theme of of migration and and the and the ways in which the nation state in the 21st century Britain in this case the UK in this case deals with migration by creating these detention facilities in that kind of fuzzy photo this is we're in we're in a detention facility and that's going to be crucial to another one of the um the the uh, riffs on Pericles that I think is important. But Adrian Jackson, when he's discussing this play, he says he started doing his, his work as a theater director with people who were houseless, people who were living on the street, and then moved from there to working with um, with refugees. And he said, you know, this this sense of this sense of houselessness, homelessness, this the displacement. He said he wanted to see if it would resonate with the kinds of um, the kinds of people that he was working with in this cardboard citizens theater and he said when they were workshopping this play there's somebody came up to him and and she, she was um from chile and south america and and she said her mother was born at sea escaping from franco's spain and so the play really resonated her with her because of that moment of, of zero so again thinking about this play in terms of our contemporary moment, I think that Adrian Jackson's production here kind of paves the way. I think it's fundamental. There are a lot of these, and I can share more about some of the other um, examples that I found in Q&A in a few moments, if you'd like, but I'm just going to call attention to two others. One is the Civic Shakespeare Project, which is um, ha has something called the Marina Project. This is Ewan Fernie and Catherine Craig. It's a, a collaboration at the University of Birmingham in the UK with some local theater makers and also scholars of forced migration there. And they're looking to Marina and particularly Marina's refusal in the brothel and finding in that what they call a sort of a radical chastity, a way to sort of recuperate that movement of, of not thinking about Marina's rejection, re, Marina's focus on her chastity as being part of that broader kind of patriarchal ownership of, of the female body, but rather the opposite, rather her taking self-possession over her own body and in a way that, that can be read as radical. Lastly, I highly recommend um, Ali Smith's Seasonal Quartet, which each play, each, sorry, each of these four novels takes a season, takes a Dickens novel, and takes a late Shakespeare play and uses it to establish sort of a thematic architecture to establish all of these different things. There's a figure in Ali Smith's um, um, novel winter, novel spring that is kind of a, a rebirth, and which is fitting here, of, of Marina, the figure called Florence, who actually is part of this project that helps getting people who are out of these refugee detention centers into freedom in some way. And we don't know how that freedom is going to look. It's uncertain. We don't actually know how successful that project is going to be, but I think it is very much in line with these labors of care and these labors of, of seeing the ways in which movement and mobility is bound up in the very kinds of historical violences that repeat, repeat, and echo over time, but also can be a, a vehicle for the healing of those historical violences. I think that's I think that's what's happening here. Um, the last quote I'd like you to read. What's interesting in this sort of very postmodern, fragmented novel is before we even get to um, before we even get to Florence, who is who is the rebirth of Marina. We we have a character who's discussing the contemporary situation in the present regarding flows of of migrants um, who are taking these very same Mediterranean routes that are marked in Pericles from, um, in this case, moving from the civil war in Syria or um, poverty often in Africa, taking these Mediterranean routes, trying to escape these increasingly militarized border systems and, and the sea to, to find a better life in a new place. And, and so this is a character called Patty, who's sort of a hero in the book, and she is taking issue with the word crisis. Would somebody be willing to read that passage for me, please? Uh, Chelsea, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I can do that. Don't be calling it a migrant crisis, Patty said. I've told you a million times. It's people. It's an individual person crossing the world against the odds, multiplied by 60 million. All individual people, 
all crossing the world against odds that worsen by the day. Thank you. And I think that the, I think there's a few things there that are really important. One is the importance of language, always striving to find what kind of language we, we use to, to speak about these sort of things because the language structures the way that we think about it. And when you talk, when you speak of crisis, right, you think about the ways that, that the southern border of the United States is often, often discussed as you know, an invasion or these, these, this, this sort of martial terminology, when it's presented that way, when it's presented as crisis and not as people, then even, even those of us who, who don't realize that we're doing it begin to begin to see other people as threat and rather than as active agents who are trying to create better futures. Another thing that I think here that's extraordinarily important is the way that Smith is taking the individual case and bringing it to the largest the the largest number right taking that individual case six, 60 million 60 million people all individuals and i think that's how i want to read pericles is not thinking about you know princes and princesses and not thinking about nobility but thinking about how we figure that um in terms of these large scale numbers and in terms of the world in which we live in which we're very aware of of the of the migratory patterns and are working through those patterns in the art that we make why did i lose my slide oh okay i um i'm gonna speed up just a touch because i don't i i don't want to take away too much time from our conversations but i'm gonna end on something that i think is another fascinating and significant and, and necessary take on this play. And this is, this is the um, 2021 Red Bull staged reading. The Red Bull Theater in New York is directed by Kent Gash. Red Bull Theater in New York in 2020 did um, something called Othello 2020, where they tried to think of, okay, in a time in which there's a, a, a national uprising over the racial injustice and the police violence in our country, what is what is Shakespeare and what is what does Othello have to do with any of this now and what can we do with the play now and as part of that they staged a series of conversations including um, readings of Keith Hamilton Cobb's American Moore and Andrew Lee Felicia King's play Keen I highly recommend both of those plays and then after that they said okay the very first play we did when Red Bull um, began as a theater company in 2003 was Pericles how can we make sense of Pericles in the present? And as someone who has thought about this play in terms of the Mediterranean migration that I just discussed, in terms of the, um, the, 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 the forced migration, it was fascinating to me to see how Gash, in casting and costume and, and, and editing, created a play that spoke to the displacement of, uh, of chattel slavery of the Middle Passage and of the continuing echoes and ruptures of that in the presence. There's um, a, Chickasaw, a Chickasaw indigenous scholar who makes a distinction in the United States context between settler colonists of European descent, indigenous folks, and what she calls taking from, this is Jody Bird, she, taking from the um, Barbadian poet uh, Camus Braithwaite, she calls arrivants or arrivants, and that's and and that is distinct from forced migration. It is not the same thing, but it is bound up in the same histories of, of mobility and capitalism and historical violence. It overlaps. And if and when Gash talked about this production, he said he wanted to do it to show not only the harm that has been done through colonialism and enslavement and the racial history of the past few hundred years, but also the joy in reconciliation and resilience and, and, and resistance and the future, again, moving toward the future. There's a messianic move here that is not just waiting and hoping, but acting and hoping. And when we get to act five, scene one, which is why Gash says in, the, in a stage reading, um, the talk back afterward, he says, that's why you do the play. You do the play to get to the reconciliation between between Pericles and Marina. When we get to Act Five, Scene One, we have we have this line that's read by um, that's read by Marina. The actor who plays Marina in this play is named uh, Callie Holly, and the actor playing uh, Pericles is, is Grantham Coleman. Um, could you please read that one more volunteer? And I promise you, the last one. 
Uh, Howard, do you want to take this one? <clears throat> yes, I will do that. My derivation was from ancestors who stood equivalent with mighty kings. The time hath rooted out my parentage and to the world and awkward casualties bound me in servitude. In Gash's reading, in that moment of con reconciliation, though that language of ancestry and parentage and servitude can only be read in terms of the Middle Passage and can only be read in terms of, of the Black Diaspora and the Black Atlantic in a, a moment in which this conversation around our racial histories and what has been and what sorts of erasures and, 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 and stories have and and histories have been accepted from that, which has been excised from that to maintain a certain sort of status quo. You can't see this moment in the play and not find this beautiful and I think necessary sort of culmination of these conversations around racial injustice. And when you see that, it doesn't matter at that point, what Shakespeare and his collaborators were thinking when they wrote these lines, because the lines resonate with us in the present in a way that, as um, a scholar puts it in the talk back, Noemi and Dae, it exceeds the meaning originally intended. It layers all of these different resonances from history into a place where, where we, we don't have to care only about Marina and Pericles, because we are seeing Marina and Pericles as emblems for this larger historical violence and the necessary and active healing that we have to we have to make happen because of that historical violence not just a focus on the trauma but a focus on the terms in the present to address these histories of trauma and that i think that this pericles and a number of other editions of this play um and and like I say, riffs, adaptations, adaptive responses. I think they're part of this broader trend in Shakespeare, um, of which I hope to be a part, <laughs> of thinking about these plays in the present, right? Not, not denying the whatever, whatever social context they had necessarily, but thinking about in the classroom, in our theaters, in our, our, our ways of engaging with these plays, how we can think about them in terms of our own historical moment and in terms of the future that we hope to build out of that historical moment and that future that demands that attitude of hope that hope is intertwined with action to to make sure we don't repeat the terrible injustices of the past so um little soapboxy toward the end there but that's me this is um where i want to end on that note they're activist abolitionist activist um Mariam Kama has this famous quotation, hope is a discipline. And I think that that idea of hope as discipline, hope as act, hope as action, is something that we can apply in the context of theater, in the context of social justice work, in the context of scholarship, and, and, and in the context of addressing more broadly as, as, as humans, as citizens, as engaged actors in the social world, a, a, a time in which it's all too easy to lose hope, or to maintain hope as a strategy of, 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 of passivity of an action. I think we have to move forward with hope as a discipline and do the work. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was an amazing presentation. You gave us so much to think about. You did it with spontaneity and yet focus. <laughs> and we just learned so much from you. Um, hope is, of course, a key word in this play. Uh, when when uh, Pericles shows up at the court of Pentapolis, his motto is a, a branch, a stunted branch with a tuft of green. And it says in Latin, in this hope I live. And I believe that Marina, unbeknownst to herself, is building that leafy shelter on that um, shoreline out of such branches and she is assembling a teepee or a sukkah or a willow cabin out of um, her unknown father's um, stunted branches of hope and allowing them to flourish through her own 
agency and her own um, in concert with others, uh, which I loved that aspect. Um, th it is an individual story as um, Patty in the wonderful novel by Ali Smith says, um, but as an individual story that is always in concert and um, is quite, quite extraordinary. It is one of my favorite plays. I'm so happy that we are producing it here at New Swan. It's a real risk uh, because people don't know what it is and we're doing a lot of education and we are basically you know, selling most of the tickets, but I'm so proud that we took, had the courage to produce this play, especially in this return season where, you know, people are not sure they want to be in a theater space at all. Um, so we have some time for some questions. I know that I've got my graduate students here who have studied the play either with me or on their own. Uh, we have people in the audience who have been to the New Swan production already and may have comments that they would like to make on it. And we do have a question from uh, Jessica Rosenau. So Jessica, do you wanna um, read this out loud to us? And Jessica is an incoming English major to UC Irvine. Welcome, Jessica. Hi, so it was just one of the things that occurred to me, um, especially because I sometimes I'll read summaries and analysis of the play to better understand it, that Maybe scholars are inter scholars today are interested in the play because you can see Pericles, Taisia, and Marina, they all kind of maintain their virtue. Virtue defined it in their time period, not in our time. That um, because Pericles, no matter what he endures, he never takes it out on God or the fates, and he even humbles himself by not taking care of himself, as weird as that might sound. And Marina, she refuses to engage in prostitution by using her wit. And in that time, you know, female virginity was a huge deal if you, especially if you wanted to get married. So they valued that in that time. And then Taisia, when she wakes up in that wooden chest, she kind of loses a sense of who she is. And you can see, a, you know, a rebirth that her being a nun is, you know, seen as, is seen as you know, her handling her rebirth, you know, with virtue, you know, giving herself to God. And maybe that that virtue that they all had in common is what brought is what allowed them to come together as a family. You know, and that's you know obviously a common theme in Shakespeare plays is family finally coming together. And that's a beautiful reading, Jessica. Robin, thank, do you want to respond to that? Thank you. And you're lucky you have Julia here, who is the go-to person on Shakespeare and virtue. Um, I, I'll say that um, that for me, where it gets tricky is not wanting to conflate co contemporary notions of what that word might mean to people at, in the present with with those past notions and also cer certainly not wanting to reinforce the ways in which as you said their sense of virtue i think is also bound up in a, in a valorization of nobility and a certain kind of class hierarchy um, i'm interested in the ways in which the family comes together through labor but you're exactly right that that labor is is centered around is centered around their and what they value and that larger sense, uh, that larger sense of, of value. I think that, um, yeah, I would just be repeating myself if I make the distinction between Pericles and, and Marina in terms of action. But yeah, I think that sense of virtue is there. I think I just um, want to be careful about reading and teaching the play in a way that would say risk reinforcing notions of, of, of feminine virtue that are that emerge from patriarchal ways of thinking that um, that are still venomous to come back to poison in the present. <laughs> Beautiful. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, paraphrase Howard's question, which is related, I think, in some ways to Jessica's. Um, he says, um, people who lose their homes and have to leave their local connections to friends, support systems, community, and find themselves suddenly bereft of everything they know, everything that has defined their identities, um, these homeless people almost always suffer from psychological trauma that corrodes their self-confidence and destroys their belief in their ability to adapt to their new state of existence. If whatever supportive services available to them aren't sensitively linked to trauma therapy, starting with their initial encounters with those services, this loss of self-belief can rapidly feed back on itself consigning them to destructive mental illness and chronic life on the streets. Okay, so that's a little essay by Howard. And then his question is, 
Um, what did the play Pericles suggest about the possibility of bootstrapping oneself out of a spiraling descent into despair when you don't have access to therapeutic support? Well, I, I think, thank you, Howard, that's, that's wonderful. I think the play doesn't suggest that you can bootstrap yourself out of it unless you're extraordinarily lucky. I think that the play suggests that you do need that, 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 that therapy of community, right? What happens to Thaisa? She ends up becoming a voterist among other voteresses. She's in a, she's in a sanctuary space, right? Um, what happens with Marina? She, she makes her own sanctuary space. You're right. That, I mean, perhaps that she herself sort of bootstraps herself, but I think that it's important that it's done eventually through community. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that the play, what happens to Thaisa to even survive, period, is Saruman revives her. He, you know, lights some incense, it get, it get, brings out the essential oils. Like there's all these sort of acts of what happens to make allow Pericles to survive in Pentapolis. It's getting the shelter and the clothing that's offered first by the fishermen and then by Simonides. So I think it has to happen through community. And I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit, um, it's a, it might be a little bit too simplistic in the lang in the terms in the time that we have right now to just say this, but but the 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 reason why we are failing on so many fronts <laughs> is because we are not thinking about therapy in terms of community. We are asking for an individual kind of bootstrapping, right? I mean, so so the, the the I think that the ethic of this play I think depends upon community, and I think that's why we why why we're always kind of bouncing between the family and the polis as different ways of structuring these things and i think those i think that those frameworks those social those those social ways of being are inherently fragile and so and so luck community labor are always going to be central great um, we are almost out of time. I, um, I'm going to have one more question here from Sarah Gopner. I'm going to invite her to unmute to ask her question. She's one of our PhD students. And while she's, while she's posing her question, if Katie or Chelsea could return to the chat, uh, links to our various upcoming events, including an opportunity to study Pericles with me on Sunday, uh, live at the UCI campus, where we will continue many of these same themes. I think Rob and I are very much on the same wavelength about why this play is um, is such itself and a therapeutic has a therapeutic mission, to use Howard's expression. Uh, but it is a, a a therapy that involves the, cons the 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 acting in concert that theater itself depends upon, and that is modeled by the fishermen and and by other moments of responsive listening that we see throughout this quite amazing, quite beautiful drama. So um, uh, Sarah, do you wanna uh, pose the last question for us? Yes, thank you so much um, again, Robin, for the talk. Um, you discussed Pericles' passivity um, and the sort of unfixed, unstable nature of his identity. Um, and so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the questions that seems to pose um, to relevant experiences of culture shock and forced migration. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that that's another place where the where the play does not offer us as much as as we want, and so that's where I think these adaptations and adaptive responses can fill in in really productive and generative ways. I think that I think that what happens in terms of culture in this play is very strange. We're sort of smashed between time periods and sort of this very kind of uh, European way way of seeing things. You know, in Middle and the Brothel, they talk about the Frenchman and the Spaniard who's drooling and all of these things. It, it, it doesn't. I don't think this play has any real interest in cultural difference intrinsically. I also don't think this play has any real interest even really in its in its in its jumping around from these Eastern Mediterranean locations, except as a as a as a vehicle of plot. But I think this play offers us ways of thinking about mobility that allow us to bring in our our our, our, our present conceptions of how culture, cultural difference, um, what did you say, culture shock, cultural identity and how that works in the present i think that i think that that's where that's one of the many places in this play where we have to fill in the blanks i don't think the play offers us a, a, a lot to work with i i think that um the play gives us the the movement and the loss and the harm and the care and the redemption and the work and we actually have to make it specific what's so beautiful about gatch's production to me is it applies it to a and really all of these adaptations 
but it provides a sense of historical specificity to what, to what it, you know, if I go into class and I say this is a play about hope, then it's very broad, right? If I go into this place and say this is a play about hope that can be applied to our, our ways out of potentially the, the, the present repercussions of historical violence, in this context, in that context, in that context, and tell, and tell my students about the difference with, uh, between uh, arrivance and, and, and indigenous folks and, and colonialism and slavery and how these things are all intertwined and then use theater as a mechanism to explore those things. That's where we're filling in, right? But I don't, I don't think the play has much interest in what we would consider at the present cultural difference. Wow, beautiful. And Chris has a wonderful comment here about fishers of men but also Odysseus. I do think that's part of Shakespeare's power is the way that he works between um, scripture and classical wisdom and also global wisdom. Uh, and this play is a wonderful example of that. It's a rewriting of the book of Jonah. It's a rewriting of Ephesians and Acts. And there's just a lot in it as we explored in our Shakespeare retreat earlier this summer that Howard and others participated in. So. You have been a fantastic speaker, Robin, and I also want to say that you've been a fantastic audience. I want to recognize that we have members of our faithful and highly educated general public here. We have faculty from at least three universities here. We have an undergraduate. We have graduate students. We have staff. Uh, this is what the Shakespeare Center is all about. It's about teaching and learning together. And it just makes me really proud to be learning with you today at the feet or the screen of Robin Kello, um, who's completing his dissertation at UCLA. The students are very lucky to have him and we were very lucky to have him today.